can you just back tap for me and see on how many points are we? And I'm doing this just before my speech as Elo is supposed to start. Uh, and I'm, I'm, done with, I'm done with my speech and I pick up my phone and I see that he told me, oh, you're probably either on 12 or on 13, which means basically that even if we win the room, we're most likely dead for ESL break. Uh, however, the fact that I didn't know at the time was that Stefan Sierdanski was in Colombia. He was basically chilling there, having a lot of fun, not caring about me back tapping, and he backed up completely wrong. It can be a voice against sexism or against uh, any kind of unfair or unequal treatment that, it, it, that you face. So I think this is also quite important. However, we get too cocky, and in CEO, we try and have, I think, around four arguments, literally four arguments. Hey guys, welcome to the Structural Reasons Podcast today. Maybe I'm taking over as host, maybe not, we will never know. But today I'll be your host, Ruman. With me is the wonderful Milos Marjanovic as my co-host. And uh, today we'll be interviewing, thank you for, co for coming, Marta, uh, here in Belgrade. It's wonderful to have you and I'm really looking forward to, to tell your story. Thank you for calling me to be here. Yeah, so let's start with, uh, how are you? I'm feeling fine. I'm quite happy to be in the podcast. I like to talk a lot. So this is a perfect opportunity for that. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, let's get right into it. My, well, at least to my, uh, to my knowledge, my fondest story that you have told me is about uh, a certain round nine of uh, Thailand. So f for the viewers, maybe you could share a bit more light because I think this story uh, showcases a lot uh, about uh, your character and your debating uh, journey. Oh my God, that was one of the craziest round ever. So just for full context, that's Thailand Rolls. This is me and George's first rules ever. We are quite unexperienced, quite new to it. And we have high hopes. So we want to break ESL, we don't want to break EFL at no cost. Uh, and the whole tournament, we are there. So we are struggling. We are there on minus one on straight rooms. It's, it, it's quite a struggle. Every round is a fucking struggle. And then it comes round nine. And of course, because I'm an idiot who backtabs a lot, I try to backtab and to see on how many points we exactly are. However, I'm uncertain. It's either 13 or 14. However, at the time, I'm messaging Stefan Sirijanski. Hi to Stefan, who, is, uh, who helped a lot at that point. So, and I'm messaging him and telling him, oh, can you just back tap for me and see on how many points are we? And I'm doing this just before my speech as Elo is supposed to start. Uh, and I'm, I'm, done with, I'm done with my speech and I pick up my phone and I see that he told me, oh, you're probably either on 12 or on 13, which means basically that even if we win the room, we are most likely dead for ESL break. Uh, however, the fact that I didn't know at the time was that Stefan Sierjanski was in Colombia. He was basically chilling there, having a lot of fun, not caring about me back tapping, and he backed up completely wrong. So basically, we were on, actually on 14 points. We won that room. However, uh, after the round ends, so Ant is judging that room. After the round ends, she sent me, we, we bumped into each other, and she's like, oh, how are you? And she's really like, really warm and really nice, which I interpret as, oh my God, this means that we ported the round. So this is why she's so nice towards me. <laughs> we, we, there is no chance we will break. I, I tell this to Georgie, he gets so mad, at one point he hits a wall. In the <laughs> he, he, he hits a wall and he's like, we didn't come all of these, uh, like all of these miles and kilometers to be here and to not break. This is a disaster who robbed us, this is awful. So at the end, when they read out our names at the break, as Belgrade being on 17 points, we were super, super happy. But before that, it was, it was the worst couple of hours of my life before the break. So, and at the time also, uh, we didn't know on how many points Milos and Janko were. They were Belgrade A at the time. So when they read out the ESL break, Belgrade, and at that point before they say the letter, I'm so worried that it's going to be them and that they broke actually ESL uh, and that we didn't broke at all. So yeah, so I was very worried. But yeah, this is the, the, the Thailand story. It was quite a crazy time. Yeah, yeah. Classic uh, devil consumption. Classic devil consumption. I was so consumed by the devil all the time. Yeah. Yeah, imagine like before your uh, leader of position speech, you're asking people to back them <laughs> to see where you are at. That's, uh, 
Uh, yeah, but uh, asking Siri from all people. Yes. Too. <laughs> yeah. Siri who was in Colombia at the time, so yeah. he really didn't care about yeah. anything. I also know Anting's perspective of this story is also very fun. So Anting, if you would like to come to the podcast, <laughs> you can definitely tell, tell us this side of the story. Yeah, uh, just an invitation. Okay, okay. So uh, let's start from the beginning. Uh, how did you uh, get into debating? How did you two meet and oh, okay. uh, everything in between? So ever since I was a kid, I was a big drama kid. So I was in every single school play ever since I was super, super young. I love performing generally. Uh, in high school, I actually went to the musical high school. So I played violin for almost 12 years. And for a point in time, I thought that I was going to be a performer, that I was going to be a violinist. However, that didn't pan out exactly. Uh, so when I went to faculty, I wanted something which is going to give me the thrill of public performance. Uh, one small thing at the time, I had terrible issues with stuttering. I was stuttering a lot, specifically if the situation is high stress, I stuttered like an insane person. Uh, so when I saw the baiting, when I saw the poster for the baiting, the poster had the head of Donald Trump and the motion was something about we regret the rise of authoritarian leaders, something like that. Uh, something like really stupid for a presentational debate. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when I saw it, I was like, okay, I might try this. Let's see how it goes. I went there and ever since the first speech, I was like, yeah, this is something that I want to do as well. So comes the first workshop. They put us to work alone to make an argument. And I got so much into it. I could only speak for around 15. 50 seconds. I didn't even make a full speech because I was stuttering so much, but I just loved it from the get go, the thrill, the adrenaline, everything. It was really on spot for me. So that was back in 2015. So this was my first year of faculty. And then the next year, uh, I go to my second tournament ever. So it's, it's called Monopole. It's mm -hmm. because it's hosted on the Faculty of Economics. So it's called Monopole. And first round, I meet Janko. Sec or was the second or the third round, I think third round is I meet Milos in a debate. He is CEO, we are OO. He reveals his extension in a POI and I am a DLO and I'm like, yes, I'm going to try and take his extension. I was unable to do it. I, never did it. I, I tried really hard. Uh, but yeah, this is how we met. When we met for the first time in that round, my only impression of Milos was like, oh my God, this guy talks like a radio host. <laughs> he should have his radio host show. Uh, so the way that he spoke was really kind of interesting to me, but I didn't talk a lot about it. So actually the time where we spoke, spoke for the first time was a couple of months later at the Belgrade Open, which was like my first international tournament ever. I was also quite new. We actually were doing quite well at the tournament. We didn't break in the end, but we were quite close. Uh, but yeah, this is the first time that I ever spoke with Milos and I was like, oh, this is a cool guy. No, I, I, I remember I just heard about Marta. I heard of Marta. Uh, she was like a talented novice uh, that they told me about and it was a top room. Like a, a monopole, uh, just, to, just, just for people to understand, you have in Serbia, you have the, the, the path of first tournament in December is purely novices, just novices. Uh, and uh, it's a very good thing to, to start off the, uh, how do you say, people who debated less than three or six months or whatever. Uh, uh, and then a monopole is the next big step, which is you merge the intermediary course and the beginner's course. So uh, people who debate one year and people who debate just now. And we were uh, at that time intermediary. Me, Janko, Isis, and uh, all these people. So. We were all like very cocky. We are kind of like, <laughs> like we, we are the favorites. Like you, you always, you always feel a lot of pressure and cockiness uh, when you are the, the, the second year in, in, in Monopol. And I remember reaching the top room and like seeing who is there. And like, I know Janko and Isis are the biggest threat. And I'm like, I need to ask them a POI. Like this, uh, like, like I have to engage with them, especially because my extension was reliant on some alternative, weird alternative or something like And I'm like, I've heard this girl is talented. Will she steal my extension? <sighs> But I have to go with it. So, so I, I bet that in she me. will. I, I, I bet that she will not take uh, take my extension. And I was, uh, I was correct. <laughs> but she was, she was very good. She was very good. Fair enough. Fair enough. But honestly, this uh, for the viewers, this system is uh, very good uh, in terms of novices, intermediaries. So uh, maybe we could uh, discuss it a little bit more. But let's get into more interesting things. So, in the beginning, you mentioned stuttering. 
Uh, what other problems did you like face, or not problems, but challenges that uh, you deemed, I assume, like important for your debate journey? So stuttering is probably the biggest challenge, specifically when we started debating in English. I stuttered so much. That was really a huge challenge for me, but I was able to overcome it by watching other speakers who also struggle with it a lot. For example, uh, I watch a lot of speeches from Ayal. Ayal also, now he doesn't have that issue of stuttering, but back in the day, you can see that he was also struggling with it at the time, and seeing him actually being super good, even though he was stuttering at times, also gave me the encouragement and also gave me the confidence that also I can be that good, even though I have this issue at the time. Uh, with the time and with experience, I was able to overcome it, so now I don't stutter. But this was the first issue. Second issue is, by nature, I'm a really anxious person. I don't handle high stress situations very well, specifically when they involve public performance. Even though I like to do it, the upside is they make me really anxious, really uncomfortable. So this is something which I struggle a lot. For example, Novi Sad, UDC, this was my second UDC in 2018. So comes round nine, and I know by backtabbing again, because I'm a weird person who likes to backtab, even though obviously it's not good for me. By backtabbing, I figure out that we are on 14 points. And if we, or on 13, something like that. But if we win that room, we will break ESL. How, and the motion comes, and the motion is something about uh, migrant parents indoctrinating their children to accept the mainstream culture in the country which they now live in. And this is a motion where I should be good. I generally am decent at motions which talk about kids, emotions, parenting, this is, this is my forte. Uh, and I, just in prep, I just completely freeze. The pressure and the anxiety, literally, I couldn't say two sentences which are coherent in prep. And Georgie, who was my partner at the time, he just didn't know what to do with me because I was completely useless in prep. Uh, but yeah, the, the devil of anxiety <laughs> consumed me at the time. So this was the second thing which I struggled a lot. Generally, anxiety, having troubles to believe that actually I'm good enough to break or to go to quarters or to go to semi. And I think this is something which kind of has followed me ever since then. I don't think I've ever overcame this as much as I overcame stuttering. So this is something which is a continuous struggle for me. It was a continuous struggle also at Belgrade Worlds for me. It just happens at a later period. Every tournament I get a bit more self-confident, but this still is an issue which I kind of have to struggle with. But you see a large improvement, I think, like from following the journey, uh, like because me and Marta were together from, uh, from your first, uh, from yeah. your first <laughs> Euros or something like this. You can see a tremendous improvement in this. And, and the important thing is when we talked about, I think you, you, you kind of uh, worked on it deliberately. You were thinking about it deliberately, which is very important about uh, what the things you need to overcome. You did not uh, fall under yourself. You, you, you actually uh, found ways to, 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 to combat this. And I think like, let's say, let's say if you compare, o Ox let's say Oxford last year versus, mm -hmm. versus then, like you can see huge difference in confidence and everything from at least the, from me obser observational perspective. So this is like one thing about me. I don't give up. Yeah. <laughs> like even though I don't know how to overcome all of my demons, I will not give up for the life of me. I will continue to work on it and I, I will be there because I think at one point I thought about quitting debating at all, especially after Novi Sad when we didn't break. I was really depressed. I really thought that this is the end for me, then I'm going to quit it. But then I realized that I'm in this too deep. Hmm. I, I, I've dedicated too much time for this in order for me to back down now. And if I were to back down at that point, I think I would always think of me as a failure or someone who at the first challenge decided to give up and I didn't overcome it. So I decided to stay there and to continue grinding until I actually got to a point where I felt I was confident enough and at the point where I had some successes that can back that up. So, so let's get into this more deeply and thoroughly. I think many people, and when I say this, I really think upwards of 80%, maybe more of debaters, even if they admit it or not, face this issue uh, to a huge extent. So can you get into maybe some of the highlights, examples, thought processes in a linear way to describe and explain how you improved, overcame, uh, this particular thing because to be honest not breaking at euros and the performance that you had at the uh, uh, majors that followed is uh, a huge 
like delta <laughs> in this case. So I, I don't think that I have like a cure. The thing which I think helps is exposure therapy. So this is one of the, for example, in CBT, in cognitive behavior therapy, the way that you overcome your anxieties is by trying to expose yourself to the thing which makes you anxious, but a bit at a time. So I just went to many tournaments. I just went to many spars. Uh, and at one point, I just had an honest conversation with myself and I was like, you can't do this. You just need to be persistent. Also, it was really beneficial that I had Milos to kind of help me to say, okay, you're good enough. I believe in you. And it was really, it, it also, I got huge amount of support in the whole Serbian community. So from people who coached me, from Ilya, from Janko, from other people, everyone was always really believing in me and always telling me that I'm talented, that I'm good. This also is something which, you, which helps tremendously. You need to have a good support network, I think. This is why I think it's easy to be good. It, it's easy to be a good debater in Serbia or for example in Israel because these are the places which have very strong communities, which are there to kind of pick you up when you have doubts. So yeah, this is something which I think helps a lot. Uh, but generally just exposing yourself to as many rounds, as many tournaments, and that at one point you just realize that a loss doesn't make you stupid or doesn't make you a bad debater. A loss is just a loss. This is just a game. Someone once told me that winning debating is like winning Mario Kart, <laughs> like Mario Kart games. It is important when you play it, but, other, but outside of it, it's not that consequential on your life. You will still have a job, a family, your friends, regardless of how you do at a specific tournament. So I think also this perspective kind of helps a lot. Uh, this is why I think debating can actually be tremendous for self-confidence. Even if you maybe don't become a world champion, like I didn't, I, I don't think I'm even in the top 20% of people like based on their uh, achievements. But I think that just like small improvements that you can see in yourself, this is something which can translate to the rest of your life and you can basically take that confidence and take it uh, on your job, on other areas of your life. So yeah, this is something which I think helps. But I, I also think that uh, um, as a community, what Marta said, you can help and support and grow the debaters, which I think is very under underrated thing that people are not not considering when they're coaching and when they're doing a lot of stuff. So for example, when Marta was coaching last year intermediary course, which was her and Georgia were coaching intermediary course. This was one of the best intermediary course that we had. But the main reason why it was very good is because they also spent a lot of time talking to the kids on a psychological level about their mental thing, about everything, right? Because if you only talk about uh, like argumentation and all these things, which is important, they need to learn these skills. But you neglect the fact that they have these anxieties, fears and stuff. This is this is problem. And I think uh, Marta, from her experience, was able to uh, to pass this on to the younger generation because of this. And, I mean, simultaneously, like I think, I think this is a thing that people should pick up, uh, should pick up and start to do with their society. Not necessarily. It's, don't get me wrong. It's not just validation. It's not just telling them, "Ah, you're great." It's it's not. It's sometimes giving them a harsh reality. Sometimes telling them you need to step it up. It's it's not. A, uh, you, yeah. you know what I mean. I th I think this is something which Harish told me before this year's worlds. He's like the mindset that you should have is you're good but you can always be better. Mm -hmm. And the fact that now you don't see yourself as particularly good doesn't matter. This is just your starting point. And you can become good if you put in a lot of work, if you actually put in a lot of thought. This is something which is possible for everyone who is in debating. I don't think I've ever seen a person in debating for which I would say this person is doomed. There is never mm -hmm. one in a million chance that they will never succeed in debating. Debating is like a game. If you learn the rules, uh, and if you are diligent in practicing, you will become good. Like this is something which inevitably will come. Mm -hmm. I think the hurdle which people have and the hurdle which I have is the progress isn't always linear. Mm -hmm. So the progress doesn't always come. So I put in X amount of hours, I will become X good. No, the, when you're at the starting level, your progress is much more upwards. It's, it's easy to progress from averaging 74 to averaging 78. Of course, it takes a lot of work, but this is something which is easier to do. Jumping from averaging 78 to averaging 80 or 81, this is something which is tough. And yeah. I think it, it is actually much tougher than uh, picking up on the lower levels. Like specifically since debating, I think has become much better in the mid tier. So mid tier of debating is now, I think, much 
better than it was a couple of years ago. I think the top has become much more achievable than it maybe was before when we had great stars. Uh, but anyway, I think this is something which people struggle with. Like success isn't linear and it, it, takes, uh, it, it takes energy to understand this and to overcome it. I, I don't want to like go a bit to the side with this, but I just really, really want to ask one question. So the reality is uh, our communities are actually maybe second best in the world. I don't know, I haven't been to that many, but the truth is, you know, Croatia, Serbia, Bulgaria, uh, we're fairly close. We can at any time like call each other up uh, in this case. That isn't always true for like maybe the rest of the communities in, in the world. And I, I feel like uh, many people find themselves in the situations that uh, we described. So what would you tell these people who maybe don't have like people around them, maybe find it hard to be like uh, the, new, the new person at the tournament, not know people, like how would you uh, help them with this? What advice would you give? Oh man, this is very tough. Uh, it's really tough to, like going to international tournaments when you don't have a community which will be there to, to support you. What I saw, I think most people are actually kinder than you might think. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people actually will be there to support you, to give advice, even if they do not know you that well. It just takes courage to actually go and ask them for advice, to strike up a conversation, to ask. I think people often trash on debating, how debating is stratified within castes and people who are very, very good at debating only hang out with other people who are very good and then debating becomes this very rapid game. Uh, but I think that actually most people are nice and they will be nice get towards you if you show them kindness and if you are actually interested in them. Uh, so I think just approaching people, striking some small conversations, small topics about the round, about the judging, about the food at the tournament. I think all of these things help you a lot. And I think generally just like trying to talk with strangers at the waiting tournament is something that you should do. And you can do this like, like regardless, even if you don't have a community. For example, the hurdles which Serbs and Bulgarians and Croatians face is that we are often very inwards oriented. We don't hang out that much with uh, foreign debaters. We are, especially, this is something which I saw with my own generation of debaters from Serbia. Uh, they would go to a tournament and they would then only talk with debaters from Serbia and Croatia. And I'm like, why are we here if we don't want to meet other people, if we don't want to meet and hear new perspectives and all that. So I think this is the way to kind of feel included. Just like strike up a conversation, be nice, be kind, and I think people will be nice and kind back. Mm -hmm. Funnily enough, cigarettes help here. Yeah. <laughs> because usually, usually the easiest way to strike up a conversation is to make a circle around yeah. people who smoke. And it's like, ah, oh, you have a lighter, how was your round, what, was, what happened there, and do something like this. So, uh, funnily enough, even though they kill you, they, all, <laughs> they, also, uh, they also can uh, overcome some of this. I'm not, I'm not advertising for smoking. <laughs> Wait, uh, just uh, say. Another thing which kind of pops to my mind is, and th this I think is true, I think you just have to acknowledge that at the beginning of your debating, it's going to be hard to feel included into the community at the get-go get because just people know each other for a lot more time. And of course, people who, for example, are in the top rooms, you're mostly interacting with other people in those rooms. So there is this kind of natural divide between how debaters hang out, for example, in between rounds and all of this. So this is something which I try to remember now where I have a long amount of years in debating to always kind of try and talk with the new people, to always kind of try and strike up a conversation with someone that I do not know and someone who is maybe there for the first time. Because I remember how for me it was very, very nice when people who I, who I admired spoke to me when I was still very novice, but I was still in the beginning. I remember how good this was for me and how grateful I felt. For example, I still remember in Thailand worlds how, for example, Dan Lahav strike up a conversation with me, even though he didn't know me. He just spoke to me like I was this like normal person and he's really interested into how I was doing and all of that. I also remember, for example, Art Mishra uh, at Athens UDC. Art is an, an amazing debater. I think they broke top at Athens UDC. At the break night, he came to me and he congratulated me for breaking ESL because he remembered from our previous conversation how hyped I was to actually break ESL and all of this. And he came to me and he congratulated me even though he was the one who actually broke top and I should be the one congratulating him. Uh, so yeah, so I remember how important this was for me. So I encourage everyone who actually has rep or 
who has so amount of years in the waiting to be kind to people who are newer to this, to actually dedicate time and to just be a nice person. Because I think this makes the game a lot more fun. Yeah, that's definitely a, a very strong takeaway. I want to get into a very particular thing that maybe this is a Roman thing, but <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we focus way too much on the majors as like main events. Uh, and we don't necessarily look at the space in between and how that actually develops. Because actually, at majors you do develop, but there are certain tournaments where stuff just click. So, to, what, for, to you, what is your like, favorite tournament well, that's not a major that you've attended Ooh. and why? I think probably Oxford last year, because Oxford, we, George and I reached the final. This was our last tournament, uh, to, or for now at least, like a last tournament together when we wanted to really go out with a bang. And it was also a tournament where I gave one of my, I think, best speeches ever. I think it was round three or round four, I don't even, or round two even. The motion was something about normalizing, talking about sex <laughs> everywhere. And uh, we were OG. And naturally, I'm an incredibly conservative person. Like, I really, like, talking about sex really not my forte. I'm really conservative, like, regarding this. Uh, however, just because I was put in a position to actually defend this made me so passionate about this cause. And I think I went and I, I think this was probably my best speech ever. I'm very sorry that it wasn't like recorded, but I really went into full mode, like fully like liberal, fully open, fully talking about why the world where this was an or would be so much better. I was so convinced. I knew that I had it. Like I knew that the chakra, the, the waiting <laughs> chakra in me was very strong at the time. Uh, so yeah, probably this was the tournament where I, did one of my best speeches and it was also a tournament where I think I felt I felt recognized so I think this is something which was all, like always very important for me not only for me to believe that I'm good but to see that other people who are not my close friends also see me as good and I think at Oxford I really felt like other people were also acknowledging me as a good enough debater and I think this is the tournament where I felt the strongest uh, so this is why I think it will be one of my favorite tournaments ever. No, for sure. Um, there is, the, the, I, I think when I'm saying this, everyone like has this voice on the back of their head that goes, ah, but what if like uh, people really don't care or like they say things like, oh, that was luck or something like that. And uh, getting this feeling uh, of, you know, people like at the bare minimum respecting you uh, is super, is very important. Uh, so follow-up question to this is, when, when exactly did you uh, felt this? Can you illustrate it a bit more? Like when I first felt the mojo? Yeah, when, the mojo. Ah, yeah. the mojo. So I think it was Budapest Open 2019. So this was the, so this was the year where George and I are preparing to go to Athens CODC. Uh, and this is one of the first tournaments in the year. And we have a couple of really strong rounds. We were debating against Ilya, against Milos, against Janko. Uh, so it was quite good. And we actually go to the finals. And I think in the finals, we were actually quite decent. The motion was about forgiveness being a virtue, which is actually quite a good motion. And I quite like debating on it. Uh, so yeah, I think this was a tournament where I actually felt first time that I can actually be good at this. We, we as a team are actually good at this. And I think this is something which gave me a lot of confidence, but also it was... Yanko, Milo, Shilia also telling us, oh guys, you did quite well here. So I felt like I was again, like recognized. And I think this is something which is like a feedback loop. You do well, then you felt recognized. And then the, the recognition and the feeling actually pushes you to be even better because yeah. it, it gives you self-confidence that you can actually do this. So I think this was my, probably my, my first tournament where I felt that I can be quite good. But to me, it's like chicken or the egg thing, right? I think you, you already felt very, like you felt different during that competition. So I know after the competition, you got the validation, but already before this point, it looked like you knew you were good, which is important, right? And this is when I, when I talked about like, I know external validation can, can be tempting as like very, the most important thing, but I think the most important thing is where you, let's say around five, where you were debating and when you realized, I don't know, that Yanko is running something very bullshit and you're yeah. like, <laughs> I'm gonna fucking destroy you or something like this. And then you were cocky enough to be like, yeah, this is, this is bullshit or something like this. So I think that the validation, the validation, at least how I felt it, uh, be, being in rooms with you and the self-confidence came way before you achieved that finals. 
and the finals was just the 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 icing on the cake. Yeah. No, no, the, the, the public validation. But I think at this point you already validated yourself, which is the most important thing. Uh, and as I said, you were in top room and you felt confident. And the top room was Flores and Yanko, Tin and uh, Ilya and me and David, right? And you were the mm -hmm. underdogs there, but you didn't feel out of place. You didn't feel like, oh, we're in the top, like most people, like we're in the top room, we're going to lose. No, you were like, no, motherfucker, th what are you running? Like, <laughs> I, th I think this was a point in time where I think this is something which a lot of pe like teams are facing. So there comes a point in your development where you are very good against good teams. But you can be very bad against bad teams because there is no room to kind of push you to be better. So I think this was one of the tournaments where we did well, uh, specifically because we were in good rooms and there was a lot of material to rebut. There was a lot of good energy just to basically work with. Uh, but yeah, but I, I didn't feel out of place in those rooms. And I think this was the first time that I really didn't feel out of place. So yeah, probably the, the part which I liked the most uh, at the tournament, after the finals, so many girls came to me and, and were like, this is one of the best pitches ever. Thank you so much. This was so good. Because I think at that moment, I also felt that me succeeding is not only me succeeding, but it's also showing to other people who maybe identify with me in a way that they can also succeed. And this is something which I think also kind of helped me uh, a lot at that tournament. Yeah, yeah. Do you think this is particularly important to you? Uh, this whole, um, it's to a certain extent validation, but also um, service that you're doing to the community as, uh, you know, um, I don't really want to get into the identity thing that much, but you know, as a woman in debating ESL from the Balkans, uh, how would you uh, go about this? So I, I also don't like going into identity <laughs> speak, but I would be lying if I, f if I said that I didn't feel that it was important for me. I come from a society where there are not a lot of girls who are competing. So I think for the longest time, at, for example, at our advanced course, I think I was one of two girls there. Uh, and probably I was the most competitive girl at the time. So I always felt that this was something, I, I never felt that I was like a victim of sexism or that this to some extent didn't stop me. But what I felt was there was a lack of female role models that I can actually look up to and that I can actually, you know, kind of be inspired by. For example, for me, it was really beneficial that we had Helena Ivanov in our society. So I never, for a couple of years, I didn't meet her. Uh, because she was, I think, in the UK studying, but I watched a lot of her speeches and I was inspired by her energy and I was like, I can also be this type of person. I, I, I can also be that persuasive, that effective, uh, but it, it is important for me, specifically now when I uh, host the intermediary course and when I see a lot of girls there, I see a difference. Mm -hmm. And what we kind of figured out in the Serbian community, really there is a difference if the course is taught by a female coach. Because if it's taught by a female coach, or at least one of the two coaches, one is female, uh, this actually helps with basically female debaters staying there and being there. This is something which is very uh, kind of strongly correlated, or at least we saw in our experience. So for me, this really is important. I would say that the thing about the Balkan and being ESL, many other people already broke the barriers for being Balkan and being very good or for being ESL and being very good. So this part of my identity doesn't matter that much to me, but being female elevator from the Balkans, this is something which is important for me. Uh, specifically because Serbia is still kind of conservative society where it is not that common to see a very opinionated or a very well-spoken female public figure. This doesn't happen that often. Uh, so just being that, for example, at, at Oxford, I opened my speech with, uh, yeah, like with something which happened to me. So when I was debating at my faculty, one of the professors told me that for a girl, I was debating too aggressively. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I opened my speech at Oxford with saying that I'm dedicating the speech to that professor. Uh, sh like shout out for him if he ever watches this. That was a really sexist thing to say. Uh, but generally, I, I always felt this kind of energy that I can be a role model. If, if I can be a role model, that this is something which is very, very good. And I like to think that, in a way, I am. I don't want to overstate my influence. But I think that, for me, this part of my identity is important. Because I wanted to prove not only to me, but also to everyone else who kind of doubts in themselves or thinks that they are not good, that they can actually be quite good. No, but that's, a, like, just to reiterate, that is huge, right? 
like uh, that, that's what we realized like uh, like we realized pretty early on that uh, like it's a balkan sausage fest yeah, <laughs> in yeah. this sort of situation it's super important super important to have a female ca team a female on the ca team and that's what we implemented very early on very early on like you you need to have you need to have a female on ca team and very important if at all possible for the course to be to be coached uh, by this Th- this might sound like uh, i don't know like uh, it's not quotas like these people deserve it and that's how you should that's how you should perceive it because like you do pick uh, in, in any other random way but it's very important for 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 women for example this intermediary course has the, the record number of women mm-hmm. uh, for us which is like huge uh, huge for Serbia in that sense and Marta like like having a like having a strong speaker let's say for Demi Krem now in the final or in Kragujevac Open or some, somebody like send somebody who is like passionate uh, angry strong or something like this and then giving courage to like I don't know high school girls uh, who feel that people will judge them if they feel uh, if they if they if they if they feel this role and then Marta like a small person like being very loud and being very big in this uh, in this regard uh, is super important from my perspective. To be fair, I think there is a debate about whether and then how do we come to the position where there are so many boys in debating and not that many females actually. Uh, if I was to go to the Jordan Peterson route, I would probably say that there is some evolution of biology here as well. There are research which shows that competitiveness is something which is correlated with higher testosterone. So that maybe this like evolution of biology also points out to why maybe there is a bit more men in debating than females. And I think that maybe we are being also socialized as a girls to not value competitiveness that much, to value much more collaborative work and working together and creating harmony and not being super competitive. So I'm not sure if we will ever get to a position where we are completely uh, completely equal in debating in terms of that there is an equal amount of girls and boys in debating. But I think that by having strong female like, like role models, I think this is something which helps a lot, especially if you can be a voice against sexism or against uh, any kind of unfair or unequal treatment that, it, it, that you face. So I think this is also quite important. So I want to go a bit deeper into this. Uh, I'll try to do something that I usually don't do. I'll try to be nuanced, but at the <laughs> same time, I'll try to play devil's advocate for a second. Hope this doesn't cancel me. Uh, so we talked about one side of the issue, which is obviously true. Empirically, you know, there aren't that many uh, women speakers. There are societies where men are, uh, to a large extent, there. Uh, it is true. Like you have to be blind, deaf to not see this uh, particular thing. There is, however, the other side of the coin, which is that if, or at least this is how I feel, if we talk about sexism uh, too much, uh, like if we overstate it, it is very easy for, like, uh, I feel, for girls to think that this is a rigged game, they have no chance, and that, in fact, uh, like there isn't that much that uh, that they can do. Or at least it's easier for them to, like, opt into this, path of least resistance, for lack of a better word, uh, when we talk about this. So do you think there is a way to achieve a balance when we're addressing this issue and at the same time we're not discouraging people from participating? Well, yeah, I think there needs to be a balance, specifically because I think that out of all of the people in the world, debaters are probably best positioned to not be sexist. You have, like, university students who are often very, like, liberal, who are well-educated. This isn't your typical sexist group of people, even though, of course, sexism can... Uh, uh, spilling even here. But I think that we shouldn't overfocus on the negatives that you face as a female speaker. Of course, some judges might find you less persuasive. Of course, some male speakers might underestimate you or might trash you in their speech or might not take you seriously. But I think that generally the game isn't that rigged. And I generally think that we should focus on what you individually can do to become better and to overcome these things and not inherently talking about, oh, the system is flawed, we can do nothing to change the system. Because if you talk a lot about like generic sexism, which of course exists to some extent in debating, and it has existed much more in the past, I've heard some awful stories that people faced, for example, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, but I generally think that we shouldn't over-focus on this. I generally, I, I'm, I'm an, like a libertarian. So I always focus on what you as an individual can do to stop these things or to address it or to uh, attack them very openly and not over focus on, oh, the game is rigged. There is nothing that you can do. This is awful. I don't think that this helps anyone. 
I also, for example, think that even quotas on roles do not help a lot. I think many societies struggle with generally sending a delegation to roles, and I think adding these stringent requirements that you need to send X amount of girls often can be quite quite bad, and it, I think it can often be quite negative in the sense of someone feeling that they are selected on the team just because of their gender, not because mm. they're actually good. I think these things do not help. Uh, but yeah, but I agree with you. I don't think that we should overfocus on the bad stuff because there are not that many bad stuff. And I think that even if you feel you, you are facing sexism in debating, sexism is present everywhere in the world. And I think that debating is a place where you can safely practice combating those things. So when you go into the real world, on your job, on your everyday interactions, you can actually bring that experience with you and feel stronger. For example, I now know how at the workplace, how I can be very open and very direct, even when I'm dealing with men who are very, you know, like opinionated or very, uh, like very well versed, I know how to deal with them. And I think this is something that you learn like when you're in debating. And I think this is something that you can take away like with you, because again, debating is actually a bubble. It's a really nice bubble where you will, most cases you will feel and be safe. The world isn't a safe space. And I think that from debating, you can actually practice some of the skills to combat them in the real world. Fair enough. Uh, I think I have just one final question because this is a super important issue. Uh, the thing you mentioned about quotas, I feel like many of the policies we make, and this was commented in uh, Tamar and Hadar's podcast, please go watch it, it's mm -hmm. amazing, uh, is, are based on a problem-solution mismatch. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we, all, we arrive to policies, like let's say the example in Tamar and Hadar's podcast where all we should have uh, women in, uh, in the CA panels, but every time it's Hadar because uh, she's world CA and uh, she basically concentrates uh, such part of the political capital or whatever you like to call it. Why do you think we arrive to such bad conclusions? I think because there is always a pressure to do something, right? And when there is a pressure to do something against sexism, you will always do the most obvious thing. Oh, we just need to have a female there. It's like, it's, it's a magic panacea for all the sexism in the world. Just put a female on the CA team or just put a female in that panel and everything will be good and everything will be great. But of course, that doesn't happen. Uh, so I, I'm not sure why we come to those conclusions. I think it's just like there is always a pressure to do something. And I think that this pressure pushes you to do the most obvious thing which might not always be the best. To be fair and to play the, the devil's advocate, uh, I think it's important to have females in the CA team, to have females in the judging panels. Uh, like I, I think this is generally important and I think it can push, uh, I, I think it can push at the discussion in the right way. I think it can help you from setting some awful motions, <laughs> which actually can be very sexist or something like that. Uh, but it's not a panacea and anyone who says that it is basically doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah, but it's also a pressure to solve something that is unsolvable, mm. right? Like, like we, people are very tough to admit that we just cannot solve something. Like it's out of our control. And this was the discussion. I was actually present when the, the quotas were being announced. Uh, a lot of the things, like a lot of the complaining about this is you're putting a burden on debating society to fix the whole society, right? Like the fact that there is less women in like a Balkan country, uh, often, like of course debating can improve, but often doesn't have as much to do with debating itself. It has much to do with Serbia as a country or something like this. And I think uh, people just don't want to admit that, how do you say, we just don't have a fucking solution. We don't have a solution for every problem. And then uh, we have a bias to action in this sort of situation. It's better to do something to wash our hands <laughs> to some extent. I will say one final thing. Um, and it will be connected to what you said. Uh, but before that, the way I uh, debated, and I think we are, you and I, we're one generation. That, that's how I feel. The same mm -hmm. way as I hear, feel, for example, with Naomi, the same way as I feel, for example, with uh, Hadar and Tamar. I've never in any moment, like, looked at you guys as female debater. Mm -hmm. I've looked at you as an opponent that I respect, and I really, really, uh, I really want to be. Now, maybe that to a certain extent made me negligent to the problem. Like, I, if I have to be honest, unless people talked so much about this, I wouldn't really think about it. But that's because I personally like to believe that I'm not a sexist judge. I'm not a sexist debater or something like that. I could be wrong. Always good to check yourself. But what I will say is that in many of these cases, 
I think the people who push these type of things uh, don't necessarily, like, it's like the minority argument. They have other intentions that they're trying to pursue. Yeah, like in the minority argument case, you're trying to win by just saying, oh, most vulnerable minority. In this case, maybe they're looking for some kind of positions in debating, it's possible. Uh, rather than actually thinking about uh, how to concretely address uh, this issue, which I think uh, if, if it's a main takeaway of this discussion, it's good for us to be to think of this more thoroughly, more complex, and in certain cases, admit, you know, we can't, we can't solve it, uh, rather than, you know, just treating it as like the minority argument in the debate. Uh, yeah. But let's leave this here and get into more interesting things. So, you mentioned Novisat, uh, you didn't break, uh, there was this whole situation in, with the round nine, uh, but you did uh, end up breaking at uh, Athens, so my question to you, and I want to actually spin it in a particular angle, which I think we, we don't really talk about that much, but what was the reason for your success? And especially in terms of the, the actual physical major. So like uh, what type of things did you do in terms of like maybe going to bed early or how did you handle socials, communication with people, stress management, and maybe even like some little things, I don't know, like it's in Greece, it's hot. like. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on this? And also generally, like, what do you think uh, made it so that you could be successful at that moment? So I think Athens UDC was probably my most stressful major ever, even more stressful than Novisad, because at Novisad, this was my second UDC before that I was in Tallinn. And in Tallinn, I didn't expect to break. We didn't break. It was fine. At Novisad, I had some expectations, but again, not that strong expectations, because I think I fundamentally knew that I didn't put in the work to actually break at Novisad. To be fair, we didn't practice as much, we didn't prep as much, we just went there with a couple of tournaments under our belt hoping for the best. However, comes Athens UDC and actually this is the tournament where we actually prepped, where we actually went to tournaments, practiced, also practiced a lot. We went to the advanced course which was hosted by Milos and Janko. We really did like, like took this very seriously. So I was stressed every single round. So every single round was very nerve wracking. I was basically shaking before they even read the call. Uh, I even remember like round nine, uh, round actually not nine, but round six. So the last open round, uh, the, panel the, the panel discussion took 25 minutes. I was sweating so hard. My shirt was literally wet <laughs> with sweat. Like how stressful was it? Uh, and then I go in and hear that we took a first and that we are on 10, which is actually good and we actually have some hopes for actually breaking ESL. If I were to pinpoint what exactly was the thing which made us good at that tournament, better than Novisad, I think just all of the prep work that we put in before it. Uh, and I think also we had luck. I think the motions for around, for around seven, eight, and nine were actually quite to our strong suit. So there was motion about like education, motion about EU, uh, I think one criminal justice motion, all areas where we are decent and that we can be good. We also got quite good judging because we were in the important room. So this is how the brackets are prioritized. So this is also something that we had like, because for the whole tournament, we didn't have like with, uh, like with the judges. This was very bad tournament in the sense of judging mm. uh, for us at least. I think the judge pool was good, but we just didn't have that much luck. But the last day was actually quite good. So. I, I, I couldn't pinpoint one exact thing. I think it was just like we put in more work and it actually in the end it paid off. So this is the thing with more work. Uh, I feel like people really, really don't realize uh, how much of a journey this is, how much of a commitment this is actually. Uh, and I think like when I'm talking, you know, with like, um, Let's, for lack of a better word, let's call them non-breaking debaters, right? That's, I, maybe I phrased this badly, but basically debaters who you know, like you're in this middle, they're stuck, plateau, and like they don't, they may, they maybe won't achieve like a break. So how, how much work did you actually put in? Can you like illustrate this? Because I think it's important for people to actually hear uh, how much effort you put in. So I think it kind of, so the thing which I would avoid is I don't want to prescribe how many hours you need to work in order to achieve X success because I think that success in debating is sometimes, it's not linear, it's not directly correlated with how much time you put and sometimes can be quite random, luck is a factor, judge is a factor, motion is a factor. So putting all of this aside, what I think we did is, I think once a week we went to the intermediary course. I think around once a week we had like spars 
And I think a couple of days a week I would practice on my own. So I would either hold prime minister speeches or I would just write a speech on a paper. Uh, I would, I, the thing which also helped me a lot, I was recording my speeches. Mm. So I was like, like recording them and then listening to them and trying to gain some insights into what can be done better, what I'm doing bad, what I'm doing good. So I think this is something which kind of helps. And also having drills which are specifically formulated to the skills which you are missing. For example, I practiced rebuttal so much. So I was listening to a speech. Then for every argument, I was trying to find five ways to rebut the argument. So five different, completely like different responses. Uh, for every argument, uh, I've also like just like listened to many, many debates. I didn't listen to that many like debate workshops because I was generally like reading stuff and like doing the, like these like type of preps. Uh, but generally, I just watched many, many debate speeches yeah. and hopefully something sticks in my mind. So yeah, this is something which I did. I think that when I look back, my only regret is that I didn't prep even more. <laughs> I think that I would have even bigger successes if I prepped a bit more. Uh, I think that I was a bit also lazy, so I would prep mostly in like month or two until the comp, but I didn't do this like for the full year or every time. So this is something which I feel I also kind of slacked. Uh, but yeah, but I think these things can be helpful. So watching the baits, uh, figuring out what your mistakes are and then focusing on specific exercises to, med to like, remedy those mistakes. Uh, like recording your speeches, prepping with your partner a lot. For example, George and I, in the lead up to Athens CUDC, we went for so many coffees where we just talked about like motions from different tournaments and just like prepping and chatting with a cup of coffee. So how would we approach this uh, uh, motion? And I think that that was also quite helpful, not only to help us actually figure out what would be run on that specific motion, but it helped us feel more confident. It also helped us to feel more close to each other, to kind of develop a similar intuition about motions and all of this, because George and I, before it, we weren't friends or something like that. We were paired quite like randomly. Uh, actually, like not randomly. I think people who, who put us together actually did put a lot of thought into this. <laughs> uh, but for me, it was a random match because we, we weren't friends before and it took us some time to actually get to know each other. So this is also another thing which helps. Just like getting to know your partner, spending some time with them and building this kind of a uh, team dynamic. Uh, yeah, so I think this is something which is also beneficial. But just from a coaching them perspective, <laughs> from a coaching them perspective, the thing uh, that I think is was and not a mistake, but could have been done better by us and improved, is more deliberate practice, right? Like people oftentimes do things that we call productivity faking, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is like what you say about these coffees, like that often makes you feel good, right? Like in, in, uh, in Serbian debating, we often did this like coffee chat and oftentimes it's like, uh, okay, I, you or Mikhailo or some of these people being like, ah, oh, can we run this argument? And then we say, yes, you can run this argument or something like this. And oftentimes, like, like if you want to practice, all of these things that Marta said are great, but you need to think about it deliberately. If you do a spar, you don't do a random spar where you just, I don't know, debate the way that, that, that you would debate always. You try to do something else. You try to do another style. I don't know, if you have a problem with writing, have a try to write differently. This is your chances. The practice is your chances to try out new stuff. And I think a lot of the time people just, they, where they get stuck is because they do the same thing over and over and over again, like basically breaking your head against the wall, thinking it will break. And it will break at one point, but it will take you three years instead of being like, okay, I'm missing rebuttal. Let's focus a month or two on rebuttal. And this is, for example, what Marta, you, you now also employing in the coaching of the mm. kids and we are employing in the coaching of the kids, deliberate practice. We're practicing this now. We have two broad, I don't know, um, we practice now characterization and deconstruction. And this is gonna be a theme of, I don't know, six months. And let, let's focus on this. So don't do productivity faking. Figure out when you're doing productivity faking uh, because that's a lot of the time where you feel good that you practice, that you did a lot of stuff, but you didn't really move the needle because you just did. I think this is something that I did a lot. I did a lot of productivity faking. I was watching many debates. I was doing some exercises, but I was not actually thinking deliberately about them. I just wanted to, so I had like a score. I just wanted to tick off this day or I practiced debating this day and I didn't actually thought about what actually did I do? Was it actually productive? Mm -hmm. Like, was it actually achieving what I wanted to achieve? 
So yeah, I also did a lot of productivity faking. So don't do productivity faking. Be actually very mindful. Yeah. So my next question then would be uh, connected to this in a very interesting way. So whenever I debate you, I, I have this very interesting feeling uh, mm -hmm. because uh, I see the fire in your eyes. Ooh, okay. there, is no, there is no other way to, to say it. Uh, if you watch the Marta speeches, uh, the recorded ones for Bre from Belgrade, for example, there is a lot of energy, a lot of passion. And I feel like uh, it really is a breath of fresh air uh, when we hit the room together, uh, you know, to it, for it not to be, oh, today I'll do three things in my speech, blah, 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 but actually, you know, uh, try to capture uh, that fire. And uh, I'll be honest, I've stolen things from you, like uh, the little Marta analogy. I've, three debates at least, I've used little Roman analogy in <laughs> our round seven. But um, this is connected to incentives. So you uh, have this fire. Uh, I also think to a certain extent I also have this fire, like there is no other way to explain it, fire in the eyes. If you watch Dan and Ayal, they also have fire in their eyes. Uh, where do you think this comes from? And this is connected to training because people, they don't uh, sit down to do this stuff. They don't even sit down to do productivity taking. So wh why, what do you think it is for you as someone who has the fire in their eyes? Where does it come from? Like wh how do you explain it? So I think I natural. So I think there are a couple of ways that the fire comes to me. I think the first one is I'm naturally a very competitive person. So I think just by nature I love to compete against others. Even though, as I said at the beginning, this gives me a lot of anxiety. For some unknown reason, I just like it. Uh, and I was also very competitive even when I did other stuff. This is why I get very annoyed when people talk about the toxic competitiveness in debating. Because, dude, I was competitive when I was in my high school. When I was in my orchestra and I played violin. I was competitive about being the first violin, meaning the person who is the best violinist in that orchestra, who is always like the first violin. I was competitive about being that. How will I not be competitive also about debating? The same toxicity applies. So it's not the debating which is toxic. It's you that is carrying that toxicity into whatever you do. So I think this is the first part. I'm just like very competitive person by nature. And I think this kind of the adrenaline, the adrenaline just gives me a lot of energy and I'm always very fired up. Uh, second part is, I think I love public performance. I think I love acting and I think I love sales. I, so the, like when time goes by, I start to see debating more and more as the art of sailing, like of selling something. Yeah. Not as the art of, I'm trying to win in this intellectual chess because I'm not good at chess. However, I'm good at selling stuff. I'm good at convincing other people that what I have to sell to them is actually worth buying. Uh, so I think this is another part which I like. I just like trying to persuade someone into something and I know that me being fired up and me showing how, how convinced I am, I think this is something which helps. This is why, for example, I admire Tin's speeches a lot. Tin also has the fire in his yeah. eyes. He, he has, he's like whatever speech he gives, he seems like the most convinced guy ever. Like this is the motion where he believes 100% of his body that this motion and the side that he's defending, that the side is true. Uh, and important. So I think this is something which also uh, a lot of good debaters have, just like this fire in you. So I, I don't know. I think sometimes I'm, I don't have the same amount of fire outside of debating. However, when I'm inside of a debate, the adrenaline and the rush just kicks in. And I think this is why I'm, I get to be very fiery. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the round at Oxford about uh, the motion about sexualization. Uh, what are your favorite uh, debates where you uh, became an actress and you took up a, a role? And uh, why do you think those debates you, you really enjoyed? Because I think many people view this game, as you said, like, uh, like you're writing an essay and mm -hmm. not so much as like a performance. And I think it would be beneficial if people thought of it in the other way. Yeah, I agree. It would be very beneficial because then you would have transferable skills to life. I yeah. think that if you see debating as sales, this is a skill that you can actually transfer to your work, to, to, to generally whatever you do outside of debating. If you perceive debating as the intellectual chess, this is a skill which is basically unimportant in your real life because, because ad, ad, like outside of debating, nothing works like an intellectual chess, basically. Uh, but uh, the question was how... Uh, yeah, what, what are your favorite speeches where yeah. you took a, a more acting yeah, role? Sorry. So I think one of the speeches was the, that one at Oxford. I think second one was Athens UDC, the motion about 
uh, schools teaching children to question parents' authority. We were a CO, and I was I was doing I was quite fired up. I was basically explaining why this leads to less trust between parents and kids. Why this is something which is awful. Why kids should basically have a huge amount of belief in their parents and should not like question this authority, specifically when they're very young, specifically when they face like specific kind of abuses. And I was really serious. I was basically really mad at the government side for not taking this issue very seriously. So this is one. I think also the latest round which I did was at uh, Serbia Nationals. So we have this tournament which is called Danny Crane, but we call it Serbia Nationals. It's open for everybody in Serbia to come. So regardless of how many years of debating you do, you can come there. We have also Croats coming there. So it's quite, it's like a regional uh, a tournament, but it's called Serbia Nationals. Uh, and finals was that we support, uh, that, that we think that Aleksandar Vucic, our current president, is good for Serbia. And I generally hold this view. I think he generally is good for Serbia. Uh, if you look at the other alternatives, however, we were OO. And I knew from the get-go that if I don't get mad and if I don't have this fire in me, that we will not win this. Like there is, like just with the panel and just like knowing who our opponents are, we will not win this if I don't have the fire. So I come up and I basically, at the beginning of my speech, I say that it is shameful that the side government is standing behind an autocrat who is pushing our mothers and fathers to vote for a specific way, who is allowing uh, specific like members of his party to basically abuse like women and, and to do all of these things. So this is where I like use my fire and performance. I think the more time passes, I see that there is that, that there is much more space actually for acting in debating than I initially thought of. I think I was also initially at the beginning, I was like, oh, I need to have three arguments and they need to be structurally proven. Now I think it's more about hitting what the intuition of a judge is and basically uh, just like tapping into that intuition by you channeling their emotions and by firing it up in them. Uh, but yeah, but I also, uh, Kragovac Open, this was a tournament last year also in Serbia. The motion was about, Milos, can you remind me what the motion was? Finals or? Yeah, finals. Finals, <laughs> It was uh, that it's morally justified, uh, that it's not morally justified to sacrifice, no. To, uh, to sacrifice civilians, no, 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 no. you so, know. So, so, so basically, basically if, uh, if there is a situation like, for example, Nazi Germany, where the Nazis are really adamant about uh, how you say, hurting civilians for rebelling against them, uh, is, it, uh, justified? is it justified to continue the fight or not? Yeah. Like basically, th that's like the, the motion was there because in Kragujevac, uh, the, the one of the, the most famous story from the war is uh, because of the partisans or uh, I think partisans uh, through resistance to the to the Germans to the Nazis, and uh, how do you say uh, as a retribution to this uh, Nazis killed the whole uh, school school, school children yeah school children mm -hmm. there is like a big monument there and we thought it would be. Uh, it would be appropriate and, and cool a motion to debate uh, in Krabu Evats. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, this is one of also the motions where I got into my mojo and I was really mad and I, I even cursed, <laughs> which I don't try to do generally in my speeches, I even cursed and then I was like, I'm sorry to everyone here <laughs> because I was so fired up. Uh, but yeah, so this is one of the motions which I really felt like. I think generally whenever something has to do with like morals or with children and stuff like that, this is the motions which fired me up the most and this is the motions where I really feel. For example, at Oxford IV, I was very sad with the final motions about the Indian like, like turning towards the West because this is an emotion where I can actually get emotional. Like, like, yeah. how, like how will I get emotional about Indian foreign policy? Like, come on, like I really cannot do this. I cannot channel this in me. So I was really sad that it, it, there was an emotion where I could actually channel this. Uh, but yeah, like generally I think these are some of my favorite rounds. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Oxford, uh, you can't expect from them to have a good final. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, let's continue then. So, uh, your next major uh, is Thailand. Um, you know, we, we heard some of the, the very good, uh, the very good highlights, um, the very good highlights from them. Um, so, were you, were you happy with the result that you achieved then? And how did that later play with uh, firstly Korea and later Belgrade? 
So no, I, I don't think that we were satisfied. So we wanted to break ESL, well, definitely. However, once we got to the ESL quarters and once we saw the motion, and motion was about tiger parenting, basically. Like it was a more complicated and fancy version of it, but it was basically tiger parenting. Should we tiger parent kids or not? And this is one of the motions where George and I are good. So we know this stuff. However, we get too cocky. And in CO, we try and have, I think, around four arguments, literally four arguments about why this is an awful idea. All four arguments are sensible. However, you cannot win from extension with four arguments. And this is something which Ilya, and shout out to Ilya, like he, he told us before this. He was like, in the ESL quarters, just have two arguments. Two arguments, this is enough to get you through. This is enough to help you win. And we were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the motion comes and we're like, no, we're going to run these four arguments. Uh, none of them were well proven. So in the end, we have one judge who was splitting for us, for us to go first. And th the whole panel was basically against us. Uh, so even though I think we won that fair and square, I still think that we should have gone through. I don't think that we were satisfied. However, I think the thing which made it whole was, like, was the fact that Milos and Janko did so well. So it was, it was not that bad because they can focus on being happy for them and being a sore loser only for me. But that kind of didn't matter. So it sounds to me you were definitely consumed by the devil. I, I was moment. very consumed by the devil. Yeah. Did you, did you realize this at the time? Uh, and did you, at that particular moment, like, <laughs> This is a funny concept that we Bulgarians like say, but did you realize that the, for lack of a better word, arrogance played into it and did you have a reflection process on it? I, I didn't actually like figure it out back then. I generally have this thing where I do introspection very like little. I, I don't generally introspect. This is one of my big flaws. So I don't think that I actually had this moment where I was like, okay, so what went wrong here? I just think I intuitively realized that we were too cocky and that basically we try to pull something which you just don't pull. But I don't think that we actually learned the lesson. I think that when Korea came a year later, uh, I was also very consumed by the devil even then. So I was still very insecure. Every round I was thinking that we forted or that we did badly. I was very anxious. So George had to put up with me. I was better than I was in Thailand. So at Thailand I was a bit shaky, but not that much. Comes Korea, I get a bit better, but it's still the same issues. I'm still struggling with uh, self-confidence. I'm still struggling with seeing what could we do better in order to win. Uh, at Korea, we do well. I think we broke, I think 19th or something like that. So we still had to do PDO. Uh, and we do PDO, and actually I thought in the PDO we were quite good. However, in the octos, the motion was about AI generated. Uh, Chat GPT based. Very relevant. <laughs> very relevant. Yeah, very relevant. Very relevant. Yeah. yeah, very relevant. Uh, so this is the motion where we thought that we did good. We, we were OO. Uh, however, I think on a split decision in the end, we didn't go through. Uh, so this is the moment where I also felt kind of bad, but I still felt that good because we went at, at least one out round. <laughs> because before that, on both majors, both on Athens and both on Thailand, we fall out from the first out round. So I was like, okay, I'm breaking my bad luck. So at least one out round, we did good. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's how it went. But I think that I, I just learned so little from my mistakes. I think I need to repeat them over and over again. So I learn from repetition. I don't learn from introspection yeah. at all, which is not something which I would recommend to anyone. Yeah. So come Belgrade, um, you and Yossi uh, have a spectacular performance. You were uh, in the top room almost half of the, yeah. of the tournament, you know, fighting off uh, very annoying teams uh, as you... Uh, as you may recall, um, and uh, ultimately, um, you were, by round nine, you were there in the top room again. Uh, you broke very high. Um, you uh, then proceed to the quarter where I would say, you know, it's a very stacked, hard quarter. Mm. Uh, you're extending on, uh, in my opinion, a very strong uh, opening team and on your government benches also very good in this case. So uh, ultimately you, you don't go through. So how did, you, how did this make you feel at this moment? Were you satisfied with your performance? So I was very satisfied with the in round. So in rounds, the whole nine rounds, we did quite well. We took no fourths. We basically I think took only one third or something like that. So we do quite well. 
However, parallel, so, so my side of the story is parallel with actually debating at Worlds, I was a DCA of the upcoming Euros. And because <laughs> Matt Hazel maybe can attest to this, we weren't that good with preparing the motions in advance. Almost every day after our rounds, I had to go on motion calls. Mm -hmm. So before the quarterfinals, we have a very tense motion call. Uh, where basically it, it took almost three or four hours. It was really intense. It, I really wasn't happy with the motions that we approved. I was really unsatisfied. So this really put me in a very, very, very bad mood before the quarters. Come quarters, so that morning, everything is good, everything is fine. Naomi is debating in the other room and, and Yossi and I are debating in the other room. Our internet goes off completely. We try to reboot the server. We try to like, reboot like the router, nothing works. So we decided to quickly move to Yossi's apartment and to debate from there. So this was already very, very hectic. I was already shaking. I was not feeling very well. I was so afraid that we are not going to do well, that maybe in his apartment there will also be no internet as well. It's going to be awful. What will happen? So this completely threw me off my game. So the motion call plus the lack of internet really put me in the awful mental space for that round. And the motion comes and I'm just like, I, I see the draw. And I already know that this is going to be a tough room to basically extend because Bisser and Maria, who were our opening, they're going to take all of the obvious stuff. Like, they're good. They will cover the ground. They will maybe leave us some scraps. They will maybe not analyze everything in the best way, but they will touch on almost everything which is relevant. And then I see the motion about the Cambridge Analytica. And I love you, Milos, but I really dislike the motion. <laughs> I think CEO, the position which we had to take, was a really tough position in, in that round. I, I think no CEO actually went through uh, out of that quarter. Of course, it's a small sample size. But anyway, I think it points to something. Uh, so in the end, the only thing which we could come up with is let's try and run a principal argument. Principal argument in a debate about Cambridge Analytica, this is not something which I would recommend to anyone. From the get-go, you, you can see why principal arguments are the most important probably in this debate. However, I just felt that there is nothing else to run. Uh, and when the debate ends, I, I just knew that we are not going to go through, that there is no way. I thought that other teams were also not that good. So I think that the government teams, I just felt that they were also underwhelming. So I was hoping maybe, maybe, that there will be a way in which maybe we can beat opening government and maybe Bisser and Maria didn't explain their stuff. Uh, but yeah, in the end, I was just like, I, I knew that we were not going to go through. And also the, the whole prep was very hectic. I could, see, I could hear Naomi in the other room also prepping. So this was also distracting for her, distracting for us. It was really a cursed, <laughs> a cursed quarterfinals. Yeah, I think we should acknowledge how cringe online debating is in this <laughs> oh, moment. Oh, yes. And how, like, even if everything uh, goes well for you, it's just possible that the electricity stops in your country or uh, some other bullshit like that happens. And you obviously you don't have a backup plan. Like you probably should, but no one yeah. goes uh, and thinks like, oh, we have the second place uh, to go to uh, to go to after that. So yeah, thank God in-person debating is back now. Uh, mm. So given all of this, uh, would you do worlds again? Oh man, this is a very good question because I have one more Worlds left under my belt. Um, so I, I, I firstly wasn't thinking about this at all. I think after uh, Belgrade, I was like, I'm done. This is it for me. I don't need to prove anything else. We broke as the four best team in the world. Like uh, I think that I did quite fine. I, I wasn't I was dissatisfied, however, I wasn't dissatisfied enough to be like, I feel this burning desire to debate again. However, now, when the time has actually passed a bit from that experience, I think that there is a small possibility I, I would debate again. Uh, but I, I cannot say for 100% sure, because debating at Rose, it's, it's a huge commitment. It's a huge also emotional toll on you because it's quite stressful. The adrenaline is there. It, it can go both ways. And regardless of how good you are, you can, al you can always just like perform very badly because the motions aren't good, the judging isn't good or something like that, or just like you, you are not in the well, in a good mental head, uh, headspace. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Uh, I can give you structural reasons as to why you should do it. But, uh, <laughs> look, ultimately it is your decision, but um, I feel like uh, the debating, like outside of your uh, personal perspective, which is the ultimately the most important thing, but 
the debating community will benefit if they see you. And it's not uh, just even about uh, the whole conversation we had about being alone and stuff like that. I really think you are a very fired speaker, honestly. Mm -hmm. I, 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 uh, at, at the last Worlds, I, I didn't particularly uh, enjoy rounds where teams didn't try to, to basically give everything and even, you know, maybe hurt themselves in the process in order to do this for lack of a better world. Word. And uh, I did two comps uh, afterwards and uh, to be honest, very rarely did I, I actually face like teams that made me do this. So uh, from my point of view, I think you should do it. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. But you know what's the other thing? I feel like I'm maybe too old for that. So I, I kind of resonate with something which Helena said at the podcast when she was here that at, at a point it comes a time for you to allow to younger people to step in and to maybe enjoy it and to maybe be a part of it and maybe not your voice over crowding their voices as well so i think i have also this uh, as a reservation i i will be old i'm already an old debater at this point however i feel that i'm here now to mostly coach which is fine i i don't mind being an old coach uh but yeah this is another thing which is kind of bothering me maybe i'm too old let, to let me again. let me argue with this on you because i i don't agree with you here okay uh, why well like Life is super boring. I don't know how else to say it. Like we, you, you get the degree, you get the job, you stabilize, you then proceed to do many things. And people need hobbies. People need to find some kind mm. of meaning in, uh, uh, in, their, in their life. And uh, to be honest, I think only a very small subset of people who operate in debating, this could be an elitist thing that I say, maybe, uh, really feel the game. Like when they go into the debate, uh, this is how I feel. I feel like I forget everything. I forget mm -hmm. my life. I forget my my job. I forget uh, uh, about my commitments and stuff like that. And even around uh, between Belgrade and Zagreb, I felt like I was in a movie series uh, that's about this. And I lived uh, for debating and I breathed debating. And uh, yeah, so I, I feel like if you really, really feel it, age age is not a age is not a limit. Like this is complete bullshit. Uh, uh, like you should be able to have a hobby. You should be able to enjoy it and uh, basically fuck, uh, fuck the younger kids. They need to <laughs> no, for real, like uh, get better if, uh, if that's the case. Uh, like this, this, should, this sport should be elevating competition towards the maximum so that we have, like it's so nice to, to hear a good speech. It's so nice to see a, a great debate. It's so nice to have these moments that uh, basically make us like, that makes the game better, but makes us as human beings like enjoy life. I can't say it in a different way. So, like, I, I can't agree with you here. I think you should do it. And, like, this shouldn't be a reason why you shouldn't do it. Yeah, I, I will definitely take it into a consideration. I think for now, the thing which kind of gives me the most pleasure is actually coaching. I think coaching is something which... It is so nice to see that actually your advices can help someone become a better speaker. It is so nice to be able to track the improvement of people that you coach, to see when you say something and they're like, aha, okay, this makes sense. And when you actually can enlighten them in a way. Uh, so I think this is something which I now prefer to do a lot more. I think probably this is my favorite activity at the moment. And this is something which I try to put in my time. What I would say is I, I agree with you regarding the adult life being very boring. So I don't think that I will stop with debating anytime soon in the sense of this is my hobby and I like coaching still. Uh, but yeah, for roles, for speaking, this is something which I would have to think about, yeah. I, yeah. But co coaching, coaching gives you this pleasure, as you said, like you kind of feel like a parent <laughs> yes. to, to, to some extent of these kids and you have like just a lot of kids uh, and, and if, if, if they give back to you in terms of I'm not just being grateful, but like like improving genuinely in helping somebody life. I think this is. Uh... So so ISIS told me you Serbs have a concept of like debate mother and father. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you every, could you elaborate more on this? Yeah. <laughs> so basically, the idea is that at every course you have to have two coaches, and the two coaches have to have different energy. So this isn't inherently that you need to have a female and a male coach. It's just like about the female nurturing energy and then the man tough up energy. So yeah. these two energies, you, you need to have them both. So you need to have someone who's going to be like, oh, it's good, everything is going to be okay. And then you have to have someone who's going to be you no know, strict, very like you have to do this. Yeah. And so these two types of energies, this is something that we try to emulate at our course. Whenever, whenever you have a, a perfect energy match, uh, you have the best course. That's what we, like our generation had like a very 
disapproving father in the <laughs> uh, which was like uh, he was nice but like he was nice in like how your dad is gonna be nice in the Balkans like yeah. uh, it, it's like you will need to fight for his approval and Mika was like oh kids like I love you <laughs> like we are very good good friends so both of them uh, helped uh, like very uh, helped you at various stages or something like this and trying to to, to emulate uh, this is very important like uh, yeah which is uh, so, so what is your energy? Oh, I think I have a mom energy, yeah. definitely. I'm like, oh, oh, my kids, you are so good. However, I think I'm probably a demanding mother, so I give a lot of love. However, I, ex I expect a lot of back, so I have high expectations for everyone that I coach. I always think that I can do better. I always think that they are not fulfilling their full potential, and I always see more in them than what their current state is, which is sometimes annoying for them. Uh, because I'm like never fully satisfied, <laughs> but I think this is a way to kind of push them. Of course, I'm never going to be fully satisfied because I know you, I love you and expect, expect the world out of you. Uh, so I would say mom energy, but harsh mom energy. Harsh mom energy. Harsh mom energy, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, what do you think are, uh, some of the cons? Uh, of training and how do you approach it? Because obviously, you know, it's, it's not all flowers and roses. It's, there are also some negatives and maybe people out there who coach, they find themselves in similar situations. So I think that there are different challenges that you face. First one is how to translate something which you do intuitively into something that you can actually explain to them. This is something that I talk with Harish and he also finds this very hard when he coaches his kids. It's, fi it's figuring out what you do well and then explaining how someone else can emulate that. That's quite a tough task and it isn't as easy as it seems. You can just, for example, when I started, I could just see what they need to do better. However, I struggled to explain it to them and to actually put it into concepts that they can understand. So there's a lot of trial and error there. Uh, I think other thing is, uh, other challenge is just like, like making sure that there is enough encouragement and enough harsh criticism so that there is like a good middle in between. So they don't feel too coddled. However, that they don't feel that we are just like like telling that they're trash and what they need to do differently. So I think this is another challenge. This obviously can be quite tough. This is why I think having multiple coaches is good because then someone can be a good cup, someone can be a bad cup. So yeah. these type of energies can uh, kind of mix and kind of make a balance. Uh, also, there's like whenever people do not come to a course, you kind of take it personally, like maybe they gave up because of you. So keeping up with how many people are coming and uh, do they like this or not? This is something which, which you often can take very personally. Uh, so yeah, I think these are kind of the challenges. I think uh, just to reiterate on the second point, I'm gonna sound like a biggest boomer. It's much tougher. Like I'm now starting to notice the generational differences more and more. Because mm. like uh, in Zoomers, uh, <laughs> the, the, the kids uh, or something like this. Because uh, I don't know, like we were, I don't know if this is good or bad, but uh, we were always to some extent uh, like uh, taught to suck it up. Like, like life is going to have uncomfortabilities. You are sometimes going to feel shit about yourself. This is a natural path of, of, of progression and of life. And you kind of learn to accept it. And I think the, the younger the kids these days uh, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes don't get this. And, and this is the, the problem is then when you have your own approach, which you interpret your own actions through your own lens, how you will see. You, you for example, think, Oh, I'm too cuddly, and they will see. No, this is so cold, or something. <laughs> so they will interpret interpret uh, your actions and your uh, how do you say uh, conduct uh, in the way that they were raised. Uh, and you cannot like like this is so natural how you speak, how you talk that you cannot even I don't mm -hmm. even how to know how to start to 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 cuddle them. You, and I don't you even sound know like a good. boomer, man. <laughs> I have to admit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, but for sure, for sure. I, I see it in our, our kids as well. And uh, if you take it to them even more extreme, I have like a kid brother who is nine years younger than me who also started debating. And like, it, it's as if we're, we can't uh, communicate on the same language. Yeah. He, he lived like a, a fairly okay life uh, because he's born in 2006. I'm born in 97 and Bulgaria was a hell hole from 97 to 2006. He can't, he can't relate. Uh, yes. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Okay, let's get into more interesting uh, parts then. Let's start with who are your biggest debate rivals and what can you tell us about that? Ooh, my biggest debate rivals. I've never thought about like rivalry in that way, specifically because I, I don't know, I, I think I like most of the people that I debate against. 
Uh, I think generally people who are very cocky, <laughs> I think these are my biggest debate rivals. Uh, but specifically, uh, debate rivals. I, don't, I like debating against you two guys, against you and Nikki. This is something which I quite like because you also have the fire which you, you see in me. I also see the fire in you, so this is quite good. Uh, I also like debating against Matt and Ahmed. I think this is also quite a fun challenge to basically try and uh, be better than the fast speakers. I also like debating against Naomi. I think this is also quite a nice rivalry. Uh, but yeah, I don't think I generally have like many rivals. I had rivals in Serbia, for example. Uh, who were basically like my generation of people. So Mikhailo, Philip, all of these people who maybe your international audience doesn't know, but I know because they grew up like my generation of debaters. So I think I felt the strongest like rivalry with them because we were kind of raised in the same time period and we debated a lot against each other. We also competed for who's going to be Belgrade B or who was going to be Belgrade C. So this is something which we also uh, did. So I think my biggest rivals are actually kind in Serbia, yeah. They went to the same tuning exams. <laughs> 20 exams, yeah. Uh, so who are people that you hated to debate against? Ooh, that I hate to debate against. Uh, I generally don't like debating against Australians because the way that they speak, it just, it, it is so unnatural to me. Uh, like the way that they very often are like slow speakers, very often not, and they don't have the fire very often. Mm -hmm. So I, I think at times it just gets very boring for me. So I, I think they're good. So this is like, this isn't a hate on any Aussie, but just like generally the style of debating isn't something which I very much appreciate. Uh, but yeah, I think mostly them. Let's get into the controversy then. Do you hate them when you judge them? No, actually, I, I judge mostly like European tournaments. So at European tournaments, you will not have a lot of Aussies, to be fair. Uh, so I think this is just generally when I kind of debate. But uh, like, honestly, when you like listen to them, isn't it hard for you to like focus and like be interested in that if, that, if it's unpersuasive to you? As a judge, I will have to say that I, am, that I put all my biases aside and I really try to examine each argument as it is presented. So no, I think when I judge, I think I'm quite fair or at least I try to be. Uh, so yeah, they're not annoying when I judge, only when I debate. In so, yeah. but it's, uh, just on that point, right? I think a lot of the judges and like the best judges have this. Like it's not like I will hate giving somebody the win that I like dislike the style. And it happens a million times. But I would hate myself even more if I didn't have integrity to, uh, to, to not know this. So, so I, will, I will hate myself, I will be like, I'm so sad that I'm giving this first, mm -hmm. and but I can still give it first because, uh, as I said, uh, imagine looking yourself in the mirror after this and being like, yeah, I, I decided to not give a first because uh, uh, I dislike the speech. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I even have like, if I like a specific style of a speech, mm -hmm. and sometimes I'm even more harsh towards those people because I'm always wondering whether this is my bias towards this specific type of speech. Uh, so yeah, sometimes I think I'm even harsher towards the people that I actually like hearing speak. Uh, but yeah. Honestly, uh, the only, like I agree with everything except I really like Australian debating style. Mm -hmm. Even if uh, I may be a bully to them sometimes, they, they will know. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get into then the following conversation. Uh, debating in general, what are like things that you think are bad that people do? What are things that, peop that you think are good? Like. How would you think of philosophically this game should develop, become, and yeah? So I think the biggest part which I dislike is generally moving away from perf the, the performance aspect of it towards more, this is what I would write in my essay if I got this topic type of speech. So I think I generally dislike the fast speaking approach to debating. I think this makes game much less fun to watch. I think it makes the game much less transferable to other aspects of your life. Uh, because like fast speaking isn't gonna get you far in real life, man. Like people actually, if you fast speak, they're just gonna say that they do not understand you and they, and that's going to be it. <laughs> so mostly people will not be able to follow you. This isn't a transferable skill then for your life. Uh, I generally think that we should kind of come back, maybe even cut on some of those structural reasons and maybe even cut back on some of the like structural uh, like reasoning of the uh, debating and maybe go more into the, perform the, the performance aspect of it, 
put in a, even a bit of like rhetoric there. And I think this is something which is available not only for EPL speakers. I know that I, I like watched the like podcast with Tin and he has this take that basically fast speaking is also a way for ESL speakers to be as good. However, I just don't think that an ESL speaker will ever be as good in the fast speaking uh, arena as someone who is EPL. However, I think like rhetorics, uh, choosing your words carefully, being very passionate, being performative, this is something which ESL speakers can do and uh, focusing maybe a bit more on framing, not only like structural reasons and 17 reasons why this is true. I think this is the path that debating should go towards. And I feel that now we are kind of at the crossroad where we have people who do both styles. So we'll see what, like which one will prevail. But yeah, this is, I think, stuff which I do not like at the moment. We, we reverse this, that's, that's the whole point. Uh, people's argument against style is usually that style is ESL biased. Uh, but that was true, and that was true at one point. That was true, like like uh, people perceived style as like uh, like a Oxfordian uh, language or something like this. This is not true anymore. The best style is uh, nowadays is with ESL speakers or something like this. And if you get rid of the root cause, and the root cause is not style, the root cause is like racism and like mm. like <laughs> like people uh, interpreting language as being as being the most important. If you get over this hurdle. Uh, we can notice, do not throw the baby with the bathwater, like uh, to some extent, not throw the style under the, under the bus just because we fear that somebody might discriminate against us to, some, uh, to, 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 uh, to a degree. Yeah, I'll, I'll say something funny. At a debate where I was OG Matkai to judge me and I purposefully did a Matkai to PM, mm -hmm. I lasted a minute, I was going to faint, my <laughs> breath wasn't, uh, like, wasn't stable, so yeah, maybe we definitely can't do that. Uh, I actually have a question to both of you, which I think is, well, I personally think I'm interested, maybe people in general aren't, but what happens behind the kitchen of CA teams and majors? What can you share, like, uh, in terms of things that people don't see? Uh, and, you know, because we glorify this position, we showcase it as it being, like, almost the highest achievement in uh, debating, obviously, after, you know, like winning a major or reaching the Open Final and stuff like that. So, yeah, well, what, uh, what are interesting things you can tell us? So, I was a part of only one major CA team, so I was the DCA for Zagreb UDC. So, for me, that was actually quite stressful because I do care a lot about motions. I, do, I, I really honestly care about the game. So when I became a DCA, I really took it very seriously. Uh, and I kind of, and I also, I underestimated how hard it is to convince the debater in something. For example, how hard it is to convince someone that a motion is bad or that we shouldn't set this, how stressful these discussions can happen. And I found that my persuasion skills are actually not that good, <laughs> to be honest, like just convincing people in the team where there is no strict hierarchy and where you just need to rely on your, on you persuading other people that emotion is bad or that emotion is good. This is something which is very tough sometimes. People can be very stubborn. They can be very married to their idea of what should be set as emotion. Should this house would then Zeus be round one? <laughs> this really, like, I, I really struggle to convince people actually to my point of view. And this is something which I found very tough. The, Benefit of it is, I think it's really nice to work in a team. Uh, I think debating is a team sport. However, when you win in a debate, you win with your partner and that's it. When you do a good major, you win it with five or six other people. So this is a quite nice feeling that we are doing something jointly, uh, that we are doing something for the whole community and something that we care about. This is a very nice part and this is a part which I like. However, the motion discussions and everything, this really was very stressful and not something which I enjoyed particularly. I had different luck. My, my CA team experiences in terms of uh, motion setting and everything was great. My takeaway is that a lot of people don't even try to understand uh, and have empathy for what's going on behind the stage, right? Everybody has some problem and everybody thinks that their problem is the center of the tournament, that everybody should care now about this. And this is especially in the online era where you have the, how do you say, uh, the, um, not opportunity, but where you, where you can write everything in Discord and everything like this. The self-centeredness of, of people and how they look is, is, is insane. Especially in the sense where you cannot really have, like for example, God bless that we have Antim for Belgrade, right? Uh, that she, she can write a very fast statements or something like this. If you don't have somebody who can write fast statements that says, that explain to people what is the situation, 
Oftentimes people just trash you. Why is the draw taking half an hour? You were all late. No, we're not late. You just don't know that the process takes half an hour and we baked it into the cake of the, of the motion. People oftentimes are very quick to, to jump on your back and to jump on the, on the thing uh, uh, that, that, that is happening. So that's one, especially uh, when it comes to some of the decisions that people don't understand. Let's say DCA applications or something. I was part of two DCA selections. Uh, or something else. People have their own ideas. Uh, oh, this person should be this. Yeah, and usually it's a popularity contest in the minds of people. Ah, this person and this person and this person. I know these people and I don't know this uh, uh, third guy. So, no, uh, this should be the team. Oh, how did you not select this team? No. There is a process. Somebody wrote an application which you didn't read. You don't know what is the application. Somebody wrote feedback, which you don't know what they wrote. Like, I, I've received so much darkness and <laughs> I've seen so many things that people don't know. And people will trash you, oh, why did you not select this person? But we didn't because there were things that made us choose this, this or that. So people are often very quick to, uh, to think that there's very easy solutions to the problems that are happening and not necessarily understand what's the, what's the, the, the story behind it. And I oftentimes see... Uh, CA team and Orcom, like um, showrunners. Basically, you're a production company. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're running a show that everybody's participating in, right? Like, like that you need to entertain the best debaters that they have. The the you're determining the world champion or something like this. But at the same time, that people along the way have the opportunity to grow, to learn, to do all, almost something like this. And this is the crucial thing. It's not about being the, 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 the CA, so you can say, oh, I'm a big CA guy, uh, great, I'm, I'm so, so wonderful, everybody's gonna say. No, you need to, to some extent, have a vision. If you don't have a vision, you're just there to stroke your own ego, and usually these CA teams fall apart the quickest. If you have a strong vision, for example, that's why it was the easiest thing in the world to work with Dan and Sharmila. They had a vision. They knew, like Dan wanted to run the best Euros possible. And he knew what he wanted to do. He was open, obviously, to discuss it. But he had a purpose of being a CA team. It was not just, I am Dan Lahav, I'm going to like uh, validate myself. Like, it's kind of like uh, <laughs> you don't get validation. You don't get uh, validation from uh, becoming and shouting and being like, I'm the boss man of this tournament. You actually get validation when you have a vision and you execute that vision of the tournament. This is the, I think, motivation of people needs to uh, kind of, switch when they're thinking about whether they want to become a, a major CA, whether they want to become a DCA, whether they want to become a part of a team. It needs to be about what you want to achieve and not uh, I'm going to be recognized as uh, this uh, boss man <laughs> or something like this. So that, those are the two key takeaways. No, for sure. We, we need to, I think as people uh, in general, have more empathy mm. to uh, people outside of our circumstances because we really don't know. We don't know uh, like, uh, for example, uh, like everyone laughed and make me made memes when Sherme was like uh, kicked out from Madrid. But like, for real, guys, just think about how how bad of a process that might have been to the CA panel. They probably left. They're cool guys. I don't know. But like uh, in general. Mm -hmm. OK, let's get into it then. Uh, so who do you think is the greatest of all time debater? The greatest of all time. I don't think I have any new innovative answers to these questions. I think probably Harish and Dan are at the top of it, probably before them, potentially Shang Wu. Uh, I think the person which I like hearing the most was actually Art, Art Mishra. I think he's probably not the greatest of all time because I don't think he has enough of like a CV to ever be there. However, I think that if he stayed long enough in debating, he would actually be there so I'm very close. Uh, so yeah, I think these are the people who are greatest of all time. I'm very sorry that I cannot name like a female speaker who will be there, but I don't want to name anyone just to fill in the quota. Uh, but yeah, hopefully in a couple of years, actually someone will be on the podcast and say like a female speaker there. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, okay, who is the most underrated debater? Underrated? Oh, I don't like these titles because I don't, because you, you have to say who you are underrating, <laughs> <laughs> which I do not like. <laughs> so I don't know, I, I think uh, who more underrated speaker. I don't think that people talk enough about how Jason Zhao is actually a very, very good speaker. I think in the team, people overfocus on Chin. However, Chin is basically a performance artist. However, all of the legwork for their case is actually built in like Jason's speeches, like all of the structural reasons, all of the mechanics, all of the mechanisms basically are done in actually like Jason Zhao's speech and not basically in Chin. I, I think 
like a similar analogy can maybe like being pinpoint to you and Nikki, you do all of the structure work and then Nikki just goes there and does theatrics. Like theatrics I love and are, and are actually very much appreciated. However, I think that basically people maybe don't... I recently give... started doing theatrics too. Really? Uh, yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So yeah. So, yeah. so I said probably like Jason Zhao, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, for sure, for sure. Uh, I wanted to ask about Ilya um, since... Uh, this is my personal opinion. The, he is the greatest judge in the world, to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I really uh, like his judging, but he's also, you know, deadly speaker and uh, stuff like that. Do you think, uh, like, um, I'm using him, his, uh, him as an example, but do you think that uh, we, to a large extent, uh, don't look at certain examples who existed in Serbian community because uh, maybe they didn't have the opportunity to go so much to majors? Uh, and how would you comment that? So I think generally it is really hard to be the greatest in the Serbian community because we have such a high bar basically for that. So in comparison to other Serbian speakers, someone who is a bit less accomplished will not look as impressive. Uh, but I think definitely Ilya is one of the best Serbian speakers ever. I think he just had bad luck at majors. So as far as I heard, every major story that he told me looks like a disaster. So I think he just was one of those people who are unlucky. Uh, I think he is mature enough to not let this get to him a lot, but yeah, and I think also Milos mentioned in his podcast, like Nikola Sugaris, who is also one of like the, probably one of the best debaters in Serbia ever, but he is underachieved if, 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 if you look at it in the way of purely what's on paper. Also, I think uh, Isis Ognjen, so who was debating with... Uh, who was debating with Janko, I think he is also one of the, he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. So probably he is also one of the underrated guys because he didn't stay in competitive debating for that long. So yeah. Yeah, if he stayed, he would be potentially greatest Serbian yeah. of all time. So if he put in. I, I will say something very non-PC. Uh, you Serbs are very crazy people. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, especially if I, when I listen to Helena's story about the tongue biting, uh, the story about the trash in the room, and in general, all you have to do is say the names of Sirizanski, Jan, Komilo, Shilia, and like, you get the idea. Uh, have you had crazy moments like this? Did I have crazy moments like that? No, I think I was very tame for Serbian yeah. standards. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, nothing, what, whatsoever. Do I have like a crazy story? No, I think I was really tame. I, I, I was always a well-behaved <laughs> person. Well, it's good for you to, uh, to, to balance out uh, the, 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 the craziness, the, yes. The craziness, yes. But they were only the, the culture, like Georgia with, with like, uh, well, well-dressed in suits. And the, I, I do know that story for uh, Athens UDC. So Athens UDC, our first major break, whatever. Uh, and it's morning of our ESL quarters. And I am dressed very plainly, so I took like pants and a t-shirt and I'm like coming down and then I see in the lobby, George in three-piece suit. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, man? So I go back to my room, I change, I put on a dress because I was like, I cannot look underdressed next to this man. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always like yeah. He told you nothing. He just uh, came down there like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was, was like, just. I, I I brought a suit. I'm gonna wear the suit. <laughs> And I was like, man, come on. And it was hot and stuff, and he... It was it... hot and stuff, and he was just like, oh, but Marta, like, we broke, we need to now perform. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Uh, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but you're not going to run away from this question. Who do you think is the most over overrated debater? Overrated? Yeah. And you know, if we could do it, like, overrated in general and overrated in current era, so is uh, <laughs> so like from 2020 onwards and so 2020 backwards. Kind of similar line, as I said before, I think Chin is a bit overrated. I think this is, I, I think, like, theatrics are all, like, well and fine. However, I think people overrate him a bit, uh, probably too much for my taste. Uh, other than that, so I generally like how Tejas debates, but I think the hype maybe isn't, I, I, I think the hype is really big, like around Tejas, so I think this maybe there is a bit of a mismatch here. Even though I, I really like Tejas, I really like his speeches, uh, but I think there is a bit of overhypeness there. Do you, do you think this is a circuit thing? Because, you know, he's in the most craziest circuit on the planet. Yeah, I, th I think it has to do with being in the American uh, circuit. Just to say disclaimer, I love the guy, I like debating against him, but, you know, Americans. <laughs> Americans, and Canadians, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, but but uh, but just say, even though I like mentioned these two, I think oh, like they're still very 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 good speakers. It's just like the matter of public perception and how 
and how good they actually are, yeah. No, no, you call them. Uh, <laughs> right. It's over, it's over. People tag the, the comments. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People tag in the comments already. Yeah. 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 Of course, yes. <laughs> uh, I wanted to discuss, uh, you know, uh, since you've been in the European debating community for so long, uh, what is your perspective on the current Euros? Uh, wh where are your bets going to be? Obviously, you're judging, but like uh, in general, friendly. Who do you think will perform good? Uh, obviously, we trust your integrity, as you mentioned mm. before, that this won't influence, but yeah, what are your thoughts? So, I'm of course biased and of course I'm hoping Belgrade A, Richard George and Novak will do quite well. And I think objectively they probably will do quite well. They did quite well also in Zagreb UDC and Zagreb UDC was much tougher to break because we had like short DSL break. But I think now they will actually be able to do something quite good also in the open break. So uh, I'm definitely cheering for Belgrade A. Uh, I think other than that, I think probably uh, the Bulgarian kids will do quite well. So I think Maria and Bisser will do specifically well. I think Alec and Velina, hopefully if Alec can find off his devil, <laughs> I think they will also do <laughs> quite well. But I think they still have some work to do. Uh, so I will bet a bit more on, on Bisser and Maria. Uh, I think also Naomi and Daniela will be good. Specific, uh, so I, I, this is also a team which uh, I would watch very carefully. So this is from the top of my head, but I think these four teams. So what do you think uh, is the reason uh, Novak and uh, George, for some reason, for lack of a better word, failed to maximize their results? Because in split, they won the top room and then they didn't break open. In Euros, round six, they were in the top room with us again. They ended up not breaking open. So it seems to be some kind of moment where they have a fallout especially in the closed rounds? I think it was just a bad luck. So in Zagreb UDC, they, just in round nine, they took a second. Uh, they were OG, they just didn't figure out the motion properly. So at least this is what they told me. So it was a fair call. So I think they just didn't have luck there. And I think also in split, as far as I understood, they didn't have luck with the motion. They didn't do particularly well on that. So I think it was kind of circumstantial. Uh, but I think now they did get over it, so hopefully they will do quite well also. And they can sometimes be very blunt, that's the problem. Yes. They're very like a, cave, a caveman, like, so, like you so, two, so so basically for, sometimes. Mm. It can be like... So for example, in the ESL final in, uh, in Zagreb, the case which they ran about religion making you a bad person, this is actually a case which I think can be done quite well. However, the way in which they said it was so ooga booga yes. and so blunt <laughs> that whoever has any like religious belief yeah. would be very, yeah. uh, <laughs> they would feel bad. Uh, so I think like the bluntness and a bit more of like rhetoric is something which maybe they're a bit missing. Yeah. But I, I think like they're working on this and I think it's getting better. I think honestly, this is our circuit's biggest strength and biggest weakness <laughs> at the same yes. time. It's very funny how there is this whole reality check moment. Come on, guys, this is not how real life works. And at the same time, you talk about the priest uh, have, having a, a, a G-class Mercedes and uh, like the, a, a person yes. from Israel, Western Europe is going to go, what are you talking about, yeah. man? What is this? You know, we know because this is what we live, but yeah, yeah, yeah for, for sure, for sure. Okay, uh, well, um, we've reached more or less like um, the final part, so what we do in this moment is we hand uh, the word to you, so you can talk about whatever you'd like. It could be debating in general, a message that you may have, personal story, like the floor is yours. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. So I, I don't have anything specific that I would just like to say, but I just want to give like a general message regarding what debating actually is about. I don't think that at the end of the day is actually about what you achieve on paper and how well you do on majors. I think it really comes down to everything, like everything that you learned along the way, the friends that you made. I know this sounds cliche, but I think it's, it's very, very true. And I think that the community and all the lessons which you learn about yourself, about the world, about other people, about competitiveness, all of this is something which is so enormously important even if you never break at an international tournament ever. And I think that like these lessons that you learn along the way are the most important things. So whoever looks at people who come to your podcast and is like, oh, but the baiting was good for them because they achieved stuff and I didn't, I think this is a wrong way to look at it and to approach it. I think a better way is just to basically acknowledge that this is a very, very, very fun hobby and a game that can help you learn a lot. It matters a lot. It's, a still, it's still a game, but it matters a lot and it can help you grow and become a much better person than you were than you would be without it. 
Well, one thing that I'll add is, uh, yeah, if you, you obviously recall, you know, our time in Dublin where uh, you, me, uh, Nikki and uh, Rock, Rock, we should also get you here. <laughs> uh, you know, we spent, uh, uh, basically the story is after the day one is done with the, the four rounds. We like, people go around, we don't know what's going on because it's Dublin. And we meet you, no, first we meet Rock actually, then we meet you and we start blah, blah, blah in our uh, very similar but a bit different languages. And uh, what happened was we were able to hold a conversation together for I think three something yeah, yeah, it was hours. Very good. We discussed everything from like history to our, our common culture to like uh, uh, basically our lives and stuff. And uh, at no moment we switched uh, to English. I think some, there was something with the cab guy. What, what yeah, did the yeah, cab guy do? I, I think the cab guy was very freaked out because yeah. we, we all spoke in a different language. Yeah, the, ca the, cab, guy was, the cab guy was very confused because it, it obviously sounds a bit different. It, it's, uh, we make sense of it, but like the cab guy doesn't make sense. Anything, yeah, he but, was very confused. Yeah, but uh, no, because the, to me, you, you know, it, um, like when I started debating, I... Uh, I I, I, you guys were a bit foreign to me uh, because you know uh, Serbs, the Croats, and uh, stuff like that, and Slovenians. But like uh, after that moment, like I really felt uh, a genuinely warm, warm feeling. And uh, I think after that, I, I, I personally, and I think Nikki would also agree, we got very closer with uh, all of you guys. So it's it's a great hobby, and you make very good uh, friendships. Yeah. That if you if you can, like they can last forever, and uh, it's a superb, uh, it's a truly superb moment. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank uh, you for having us. Yeah, we we we'll, we'll may we may do something next year uh, as well. Like uh, uh, maybe we'll have also some other uh, serves uh, with some interesting takes. Uh, and yeah, it was a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, guys. And I can shake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>